I'm Andrew Stewart, and I'm the STS Research Co Committee Co-Chair. My pronouns are he, him. I'd like to provide a few acknowledgments and announcements before we begin. First, I would like to extend my deepest appreciation to the members of the STS Research Committee who spent many hours discussing and voting on all the submissions um, and then working with the presenters to answer questions um, and provide guidance. And I'd like to offer an extra thanks to my co-chair, Jean Hoover, because she has been doing a major heavy lift as far as coordinating and making this forum happen. So I would like to also thank the STS Membership and Recruitment Committee for hosting the STS Research Forum and membership chat. We'd like to especially thank Kathy Lotz. We would also like to remind you that the ALA Virtual Meeting Code of Conduct governs the behavior of all participants. We'd like us and meetings and applies to the forum today. And finally, a couple of housekeeping notes. This session is closed caption, but in order to turn on the captions, you must first find the live transcript on your um, control panel and click show subtitle. All participants will remain muted. If you have questions during the pre presentations, please type them in the chat and they will be collected. We'll have three 20 minute presentations followed by breakout rooms, one of which includes a discussion with the presenters of our three presentations today. Our presentations are as follows. The use of preprints in doctorate programs, a citation analysis study of trends in chemistry and physics dissertations by Amanda McCormick, Elizabeth Brown, Clara Tran, and Kathleen Flynn, promoting equitable and accessible course materials for STEM students, Alvaro Casada, Carrie Carlotto, Jane Lau, and Holly Thompson, and leveraging outreach information literacy and vulnerable students, persistence in STEM, Elizabeth Pickard and Michelle Desolettes. So without further ado, I will turn the session over to Amanda and her colleagues for our first presentation. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, is the slideshow showing? Yeah, okay, excellent. Okay, so I'm Elizabeth Brown. I'm going to lead us off um, with the speakers um, in our uh, session, our, our talk today. And so, good afternoon um, and welcome to our presentation. Trends Analysis of Citations in Chemistry and Physics of PhD Dissertations at the State University of New York Doctoral Centers. Uh, the State University of New York is also known as SUNY, for those of you who may um, have not heard the full title. So um, my colleagues are Kathleen Flynn from the University at Albany, Clara Tran from Stony Brook University, and Amanda McCormick from the University at Buffalo. Next slide. So a little bit of information about SUNY is on this slide. And so you can see in the middle of the picture, there's an image of uh, all of the different campuses within SUNY. We have approximately 64 campuses um, at the community college, four-year comprehensive and doctoral level. And so the doctoral level uh, institutions are here, um, Albany, Binghamton, Buffalo, and Stony Brook. And you can see from the numbers of students and faculty, that Albany and Binghamton are very close in size, and the chemistry departments are very similar in size as well. Uh, Buffalo and Stony Brook have significantly larger uh, campuses as a whole. They have about twice as many students and about twice as many faculty, or almost three times as many faculty actually, and they have uh, significantly more chemistry faculty, graduate and undergraduate students. Next slide. 
So this is the physics data for those uh, same to, for those same uh, campuses. Albany and Binghamton again are, are quite similar, or maybe Binghamton slightly larger for undergrads. Buffalo has a slightly more graduate students. And Stony Brook is significantly larger than the rest of the other three campuses, uh, mostly due or partially due to the fact that it's affiliated with Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island. Uh, next slide. So for our study, we wanted to see the comparison of uptake in open access and open science between chemistry and physics, specifically adoption of preprints in chemistry with advent of newer preprint servers and the fact that preprints are not peer reviewed. And so we looked at you know, a subset of researchers in each of the two subjects uh, in our respective departments. And so we wanted to compare our subsets and our data to see what kind of results we would see. Next slide. And so some additional questions that we wanted to answer for our project were how often preprints were referenced in chemistry and physics dissertations. We suspected that due to the culture within chemistry specifically, and because of the newness of these preprint servers, we, you know, we weren't sure how many preprints were being used and cited in the literature at this point. And we knew that physics was, you know, further along in the evolution of use of preprints. So we suspected there would be more preprints, but we weren't sure exactly how many would be in each. And so, you know, there's a difference rate of citation. And, you know, what other sources are our, our PhD students using when they're write, they write their dissertations? We know that most PhD students are closely affiliated with their advisor and, and have um, you know, a close affinity with their work. So we knew that whatever the PhD students were writing would also be reflected in what faculty members would be using as well. And so because we were able to look at all of our different campuses together, we wanted to see if there were patterns of use and if there was a way to coordinate collection building and collaboration between our centers in the state. And Kathleen is now going to talk about preprints and open access sources in chemistry. Thanks, Beth. So as Beth said, we were curious about the frequency of citations to preprints by chemistry and physics graduate students. So preprints are manuscripts of original scholarly research that have not yet been peer reviewed or published in a journal. And preprint servers are repositories where authors can upload their preprints and get a number of benefits. So publishing a preprint gives the authors priority for their original ideas, which is especially useful if it may be several months to a year before the work is eventually published in a peer reviewed journal. Authors can get feedback from their peers to improve their work. Preprints support open access as they're freely accessible. And this will also increase the visibility of the work and can result in more citations. And finally, authors can network with their peers and collaborate in the future. Next slide. There are many preprint servers, but three of the main ones for the sciences are Archive, BioArchive, and ChemArchive. Archive was launched in 1991, and it mostly contains preprints in physics. However, it has expanded to include other areas such as mathematics and computer science. And it's managed by Cornell University, but funded by members, affiliates, and some company sponsors, and it currently contains over 2 million preprints. BioArchive is a preprint server for biology, and that launched in 2013. It's managed by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and it receives funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and it contains more than 161,000 preprints. And then ChemArchive is the most recent of this group, as it launched in 2017, and this is a preprint server for chemistry, and it's managed by several chemical societies, including ACS, and ProQuest is a sponsor. And to date, it contains over 13,000 preprints. And it's worth noting that BioArchive and ChemArchive only accept preprints that have not been accepted for publication yet, but Archive will accept ePrints, whether they've, they're pre or post peer review publication. So this may be one reason for a lower number of preprints in Bio and ChemArchive. Next slide. So just to get an idea of the popularity of these preprint servers, here's a visual showing how ChemArchive has grown since 2017 when it launched. So we can see that there was an increase in 2020, 
possibly affected by the pandemic, but it has decreased a bit since then. Next slide. However, we can see with Archive, which has a physics focus, that there's been a steady increase in downloads since the early 90s when it launched. So you can see that the downloads are in the tens of millions each year now. So Archive is definitely popular and well-established. Next slide. These charts give some more context around how Archive is being used by our four institutions. We can see here there's a, a trend that Stony Brook is a big supporter and user of Archive as, as well as Buffalo, both in submissions and downloads. Um, these two institutions are larger than Binghamton and Albany though. Uh, institutions can also become members of Archive in that the, they can support it financially and they can receive some benefits then. So Binghamton has just joined this year. Buffalo has been a member for a number of years and Stony Brook supports it as well. Next slide. So as preprints are not peer reviewed, you may think that publishers are wary of them, but in fact, preprints are encouraged by the large publishers, including ACS and Royal Society of Chemistry uh, for chemistry. And then uh, it's a little odd then that preprint usage in chemistry is, is a bit low. Uh, in physics, it's almost built into the publication process and that some publishers let authors enter the archive ID for their manuscript to make the submission process easier. For example, IOP allows authors to link directly to archive their archive preprint in their submission process. Next slide. Here are two other examples of publishers who are supportive of preprints. So AAAS, the publisher of the science journals and Elsevier um, also support preprint sharing and usage. Uh, so now I'll pass it on to Clara to talk about our methods and results. Claire, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. We can hear you now. Okay. Um, let me move the screen back. Okay. Uh, let me start. Um, the steps shown are the data collection and review steps. We decided to individually analyze our data as consistently as possible, and then we compare our results. Our study was originally focused on chemistry dissertations, chem archive launch in 2017, and there was a lot of press around the launch. As librarians, we are familiar with archive, but we were curious to see how chemists would interact with chem archive. After we presented at the ACS conference and received a question about how frequently physics preprint was cited in dissertations, we decided to expand our scope of our study last summer. We work on this past year to collect our physics data. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is an overview of various resource types, which were used in the 10 chemistry and physics dissertation of each SUNY school from 2018 to 2021. We standardized the resource type. We defined uh, the article type as including reviews, communications, letters, etc. For resources that were used but were not included in our standardized list, we put them into the other resource type category. Data shows that a total of 13 resources types were used in the study. Not all, but most of the resource types were used in all four SUNYs. Data also showed that journal articles and book slash book chapters are the top resource types used in chemistry and physics across the four SUNYs. Notably, resource types such as preprint uh, as highlight and video were used in the dissertations. Interestingly, Wikipedia, which were classified under website resource type, was also used in dissertations. Next slide, please. Um, as our study focused on chemistry and physics preprint, we take a deeper look of these preprint results. 
Overall, in our study, students did not cite camp preprints very often. At each school, preprint accounted for less than 1% of citation. However, there were some interesting results regarding the age of the preprint citations. For instance, at Albany, the older preprint citation was 26 years old, and the mean age was 5.8 years. Stone Ripple also had a 13-year-old preprint citation. As preprints are seen as an early look into research that will most likely be published in a peer review journal in the next few years, it is odd that students were citing preprint over 10 years old. One possible reason for this is that the published version existed, but the student didn't search for it or chose not to cite it. Most preprint servers automatically add the journal reference once the article is published. And many of our preprint citations had these journal references in the preprint records, such as in archive. Either the student didn't see it or they didn't think it was necessary to find the published version, which might have important revisions. Next slide, please. And other possible reason for the older citation is where the student found the preprints. It was interesting that eight out of 14 preprint citations in Albany dissertation were written by student's advisor. Some of these preprints were cited as um, under review and some were listed as unpublished and were not discoverable. Three other schools did not have any preprint written by the student's advisor. Interestingly, our result only contained two citations to CAM archive. As this is still very new, there might be more citations in the future. Other interesting sources for preprint were the ACS preprint journals, polymer preprints, and preprints from the Division of Energy and Fuels. Next slide, please. Uh, as compared to the CAM preprint citation, students cited physics preprints more often, except Binghamton. Three other schools had preprints ranging from 2% to 9% of citations. Again, there are some interesting results regarding the age of the preprint citation. Overall, at each school, the age of the physics preprint contains um, uh, much older than the CAM preprint citations. For instance, at Stony Brook, the old, this preprint citation was 54 years old, and the mean age was five years. Albany also have a 33-year-old preprint citation. Next slide, please. So as for the preprint sources, 15 out of the 40 preprint citation in Albany physics dissertation were written by the student's advisor, while 23 out of 152 preprint citation in Stony Brook physics dissertation were written by the student's advisor. Binghamton and Buffalo each has one such preprint citation. In addition to the well-known archive, which was heavily used as a preprint source, other preprint sources were CERN, ResearchGate, materials, cloud archive, inspire, etc. Interestingly, there's one citation to CAM archive as well. Now I'll turn it over to Catherine, who will talk a bit more about the archive ID and previous studies. Thank you. Uh, so one interesting thing that we noticed in Albany and Stony Brook physics dissertations was the inclusion of the archive ID in a citation to a published work, so not a preprint. We think this is another example of the acceptance of archive in the physics community. So at Albany, there were 40 citations to archive preprints, but 25% of all citations included the archive ID in the reference. And here on the screen is an example. So we see that this is an article published in a journal, but they've included the archive ID as well. And as a side note, we also noticed that a number of the physics dissertations relied upon LaTeX and BibTeX bibliographies. And this is possibly due in part to the fact that publishers tend to require those files in the submission process. And students can easily get those BibTeX citations from citation generators or from Google Scholar. So if you notice a lot of errors in the citations, it's good to remember that the student may be grabbing the citation from those generators and not proofreading it. Next slide. We're at about five minutes. Okay, thank you. 
uh, as for how our results compare to previous studies, other studies completed before ChemArchive launched also showed that less than 1% of citations were to preprints. So as our results are similar and we looked at years after ChemArchive launched, it's possible preprints are not yet becoming more distributed or accepted in the chemistry field. For physics, a study published in 2015 that analyzed physics dissertations uh, found preprints were cited 2.6% of the time over the years 1998 to 2012. And a 2023 study looking at physics dissertations published between 1970 and 2020 found the percentage of citations to preprints was only 0.4%. However, we should remember that archive began in 1991. So our percentages of preprints cited ranged from 0.8% to 9.1%. And across all four campuses, it was 4.5%. And although this percentage is higher than previous studies and suggests physics students are citing preprints more in the last decade, the percentages varied greatly across our four campuses. So this suggests it is partly influenced by the culture of the department, advisor advice, et cetera. So now I'll pass it on to Amanda to talk about our statistical analysis. Okay, so uh, we also wanted to take a look at the data that we collected and compare the rates of citations to preprints between the disciplines of chemistry and physics. So we found ourselves with a data set that did not have a normal distribution. It was very off. Um, so we decided to consult the statisticians at the University of Albany's Data Management and Analytics Center to help us analyze the data. And we found using a man whitney u test, uh, we found that physics dissertations were significantly more likely to include at least one preprint source than our chemistry dissertations. So this is a graph of the frequency of preprint citations in both disciplines. We also found, again, using the same Mann-Whitney test, uh, of the dissertations that cited at least one preprint, among that specific group of dissertations, physics dissertations still included significantly more preprint sources. So I'm kind of keep buzzing through here before we run out of time. Um, so then uh, as, as we were also looking at collection development, we also want to briefly share the results of our additional analysis. Once we completed our preprint analysis, we moved into comparison of other resources. As you can see from this graph, articles were our most frequently cited resources in both physics and chemistry. And then we took a look at the top five journal titles that were cited by each SUNY. You'll see here that JAX, uh, Journal of the American Chemical Society, is the most frequently cited title right across the board for all four of our SUNYs. Um, additionally, ACS is the publisher of many of these top five journals. So in general, we do think that the top journals reflect the focus of the research being conducted at each SUNY. So similarly for physics, uh, the most cited titles actually reflect a little bit more diversity um, in the title research. Uh, Physical Review Letters was the most cited journal across all of our SUNYs. It ranks differently at each SUNY, however. Uh, similar to the chemistry publications, note that only a handful of publishers are present on the list, and APS here is the most cited publisher. And I am going to turn that back over to Beth to wrap us okay. up. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to very quickly just spend a few moments on our next steps since we're close to time. Uh, we have a number of thoughts that we're hoping to explore further as we write up our results for publication. Uh, they're listed here. I'll just briefly say that uh, we want to continue research on the uptake of chemistry preprints by academia because we know that we're in the earlier stages of that compared to physics, and we think we'll see some interesting uh, behavior, you know, coming up in the future. And we do definitely want to work on collection development and how we can better uh, share our resources among our campuses and, you know, make sure that the unique resources between each uh, individual campus uh, is kept at that campus so that they have you know access to the materials they need. And so I'm going to go to the next slide and just thank everyone for listening to our talk. And I think we may have a little bit of time for question, a question or two.
If there aren't any questions right now, you can, of course, ask them at the end of the session when we move into breakout rooms. Um, you can also put them in chat and we'll pick up later. Lorraine? Hi, I, I started to type it and then I realized I was going to not, not have time, but you mentioned the collection development implications that you might find across the campuses as related to this study. And I, I hoped you would explain more about that. I didn't know what connections you were making through this study and how that would help you with, with deciding about holdings at the different locations. I can take that one. Um, so what we really had in mind was the, uh, I guess it's a couple of years old now, we had a big deal between the SUNY Consortium of Libraries and Elsevier. So we wanted to take a look, which, um, which kind of consolidated our resources and we limited certain titles and things like that. Um, but most of our contracts are actually not through the SUNY Consortium. We all have individual contracts. Um, with all the different publishers. So we just kind of wanted to take a look and see uh, what we were all using, right, at the different research centers, because we do have um, such strong programs at these four places. We just wanted to kind of see if anything matched up or if any patterns emerged. So not necessarily related to preprints, but just what you could could figure out about users in your different locations. Yeah, it, it kind of grew out of, you know, counting the preprints. We noticed all the different articles, or all, we noticed that like 90% of the resources cited were indeed articles. So we thought we'd take a look at that data as well. Thank you. There's one more question on software and programming tools to track citations. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I'm the person who started it, but I think Kathleen showed us how to download and um, add our, well, actually she started, she had the template for the citation, citations that we, for the data that we collected. Yeah, I think I, I, uh, we pulled the papers. Um, I had them in Zotero. And then I think we kept track of our data in Excel, and then we used uh, that and a combination. I also used R to do a little bit of the analysis, but we used um, Excel mostly to keep track of the data and do analysis. Okay, hey, thank you everyone for your questions. I think we're gonna move on to the next presentation. Okay, um, I'm going to introduce our project. My name is Holly Thompson. I am the head of the Science and Engineering Library at the University of Southern California. And I'll be introducing our project promoting equitable and accessible course materials for STEM students. And what this project is really about is exploring um, the interest and ability to adopt open education resources in STEM. Next slide, please. So just briefly to introduce our team, all of the librarians in our library participated on this project. So um, I introduced myself, I'm the head of the library. We had Carrie Carlotto, who is our liaison to the School of Engineering, Jane Law, our uh, chemistry liaison, and our project leader, uh, Alvaro Quesada, who is liaison to astronomy, physics, mathematics, biological sciences. Next slide, please. Uh, the reason we wanted to explore um, working with open education resources in STEM, um, well, there's several reasons. So the first being there's a real lack of initiatives at our, on our campus um, at an institutional level that support engaging with open resources. There's no recommendation. There's no support. There's no guidance. Um, so it's all really driven on an individual basis. Um, related to that, there's the rising cost of textbooks and especially STEM textbooks that we know um, impact students' ability to uh, complete courses or stay enrolled in courses, uh, stay enrolled in um, college. And so that's a, a really significant barrier to success. So related, and then related to that, 
is um, at a high level, uh, we, our collection development policy is to not purchase textbooks to be placed on reserves. So faculty can of course donate or purchase the textbooks themselves and we'll put them on reserves, but we won't purchase them. So our team was, we're, we were having these discussions about the role of the academic library um, in helping bridge these barriers and some of the frustrations we had with not being able to sort of directly purchase and help support students um, accessing the required textbooks. Um, so we really wanted to explore a way to make um, materials, course materials more equitable and accessible. Um, there was a previous iteration of this project uh, um, in our library system, but it focused on the humanities. So we didn't know how feasible it was um, first step. So those were some of the motivating factors for engaging with this project. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the structure of the project, it had these uh, five key components. So first it was really a collaborative um, effort with between the librarians um, and STEM faculty. We wanted faculty to sort of be the drivers of this change. So we wanted to support them and help them um, identify, evaluate and adopt an open resource to replace a traditional textbook. Um, we wanted to encourage participation by providing a financial incentive. Um, so we were get awarded money from our Dean of Libraries to provide a financial incentive. I'll break that down in another slide. Um, and that was also to acknowledge the, um, the time that the faculty members were going to have to invest in making such a transition from a traditional textbook to an open resource. <clears throat> We also partnered with um, a center on our campus called the Center for Excellence in Teaching, and they provided the instructional design support. So questions about changing assignments or changing exams, uh, they could really support the faculty through those uh, decisions. At the library, we hosted two workshops, one in the fall, which provided a general overview of open education resources, how to find them and evaluate them. Um, then they met with the member from the Center for Excellence in Teaching. And then we had another workshop where the faculty came together to talk about their experiences um, looking for and adopting uh, open resources and what challenges they were having. <clears throat> and throughout the year, um, they had direct librarian support. So we did assign specific faculty to each librarian. So they had an individual they knew they could contact if they needed help. And what the librarians did was sort of that more in-depth searching for open education resources um, or brainstorming. If they couldn't find an appropriate open resource, what would be a, an appropriate plan B? Our ultimate goal was to remove a cost uh, burden for students. So we agreed that if an open resource could not be identified, a, a second option could be uh, finding library resources that have already been purchased or licensed to replace the traditional textbook. Um, but we didn't necessarily lead off with that as an option. We really wanted to explore open resources. Next slide, please. So we um, structured uh, that, per that project proposal. We advertised it. Um, the Center for Excellence in Teaching actually promoted it for us as well. Um, and we received our applicants. And, and, and when we were reviewing them and deciding who to select for uh, participation, we really wanted to have a diversity of STEM disciplines re represented. We wanted to um, include lower level courses that had high enrollment. Um, we thought that would be you know, a, a more obvious demonstration of impact, but also perhaps there would be OER, more general OER available for those classes that we could find. And we didn't require any previous OER experience or knowledge for participation. Um, we did develop a rubric to help us make our decisions about participants. So again, looking at the course, the enrollment size, and then also the impact statement that we asked the applic uh, applicants to provide about how OER would really um, improve the learning experience for their students. Uh, next slide, please. So this is actually a project that we've been able to do over the last two years. So we've had two cohorts. Um, in the first year, we were provided about $6,000 um, for the financial incentive to uh, give to faculty participants. And since the first year was a pilot, um, we were going to offer a larger incentive, $750 for up to eight participants. Uh, and we received 17 applications. 
which was really encouraging. We thought that meant there was a, a good amount of enthusiasm around this. Um, that first year was really successful. Everyone, all the participants replaced their um, traditional textbook with an open or otherwise free um, resource. So in year two, we had the same amount of funding, but we decided to reduce the incentive size so that we could have more participants. Um, but we only received four applicants, <laughs> applications. Um, we'll talk about this later in the challenge uh, as we talk about challenges. Um, and we went back and forth about whether or not to increase the incentive for the participants, um, but we decided just to leave it as it was advertised and pivot and take the remaining funds to fund the creation of an open textbook. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Alvaro, who's gonna talk about the courses that were impacted by this project. Thank you for that, Holly. Uh, these are the courses we included in our projects. As you can tell, we have a good representation of STEM uh, within our courses, and the level of the courses are also a fair representation. Uh, I would have very much enjoyed uh, talking to you about each and single one of these courses, but due to our time allotted, I'm only going to highlight a, a couple of these courses. Uh, one of the courses we selected in year one is Environmental Sciences 413. Uh, one of the reasons we included this course into our project is because uh, a central principle within the field of environmental studies is to support equitable resources access. And I think uh, utilizing appropriate educational resources that are available to students at USC and also accessible for knowledge seekers outside of our institution uh, is a de uh, demonstrative invocation of this uh, principle. Uh, the course title is is sustainable aquaculture and food security. Uh, another reason we selected this course is because it is highly interdisciplinary and requires integration across multiple uh, natural and social sciences fields. Uh, the faculty member teaching uh, this course, uh, their expertise is largely from the biological and environmental sciences, uh, but a complement of social policy and economic uh, principles that intersect with the natural sciences principles are a key to the course plan. Therefore, the textbooks that had previously been evaluated for the course were insufficiently comprehensive and only offered support for more uh, for some course sections. Uh, primary research literature was incorporated to fill information gaps. Also, these textbooks are generally low print, low circulation, are an extremely expensive, which is against the central principle of environmental science as a, as a field. Uh, now, I'll discuss the process of selecting an OER for this course. Uh, the focus of this OER remained on, funda on the fundamental course unit concepts that allowed pre-class exposure. Uh, shifting time spent on these foundational elements to pre-class work uh, would allow in-class time to be more effectively allocated to uh, refining comprehension of these fundamentals and progression towards implementation of these fundamentals within uh, primary literature evaluation, discussion, and other active in-class lessons. Again, the focal area of this OER are the concepts outside of our faculty members' expertise um, or experience. Uh, another course we selected is Math 125, which was Calculus 1. When we saw this course in our list of applications, we were extremely excited. Uh, it is an ideal lower level GE with high enrollment. We were hopeful that if we were able to find a quality OER for this course, uh, that it would provide a model for the other sections and have the remaining faculty members teaching this course racing to adopt the OER into their own sections, which would be about 500 students every semester. Spoiler alert, other faculty were reluctant to follow suit. In fact, the main challenges we experienced here uh, was departmental approval to use the OER, uh, but we'll get to that in, in, in a minute. Uh, another reason we decided to select this course is that our pr preliminary survey of the OER landscape revealed that uh, a large section of calculus, there was a large selection of calculus one textbooks available. And as many of you already know, the cost for the math textbooks is at an all time high. Uh, many of the concepts covered in Calculus 1 are difficult to describe as an OER that focuses on incorporating visualizations and animation would help students process and understand the concepts. The faculty member wanted the OER to be flexible that provided students the option of having it completely accessible online or as a PDF version, version that would allow them to print the material. Uh, our team provided an extensive list of OER that met the faculty members criteria. Uh, there were a total of about 25 viable options for this course. Uh, 
Uh, overall, the faculty member chose an interactive book called Active Prelude to Calculus. Um, departmental issues would not allow the faculty member to adopt the resource officially. Uh, therefore, she couldn't list it on her syllabus as the official uh, course textbook. Um, that was not, she was not able to shift away from what the department had already uh, approved, but uh, within her own class, she was, um, she does not require it to be purchased and bases her teaching on the OER that we, um, that we helped her uh, in finding. The last course I would discuss is uh, Spatial Sciences 589, which is cartography and visualization. Uh, we selected this course because the master level course provided us the opportunity to incorporate an OER textbook and exemplify the versatility of OER in advanced courses. Uh, we were hopeful that this course would also help us gain traction with the OER conversation at the institutional level. Um, also, we selected this course as many students are concerned that they will lose access to their projects uh, created using ArcGIS after they graduate. Other students felt that making spatial uh, analysis software free and widely available is a means of democ uh, democ democratizing the field and addressing fundamental imbalances of power. Other students anticipated themselves working in the nonprofit space, thus needing an affordable means of performing spatial analysis for the greater good. Uh, thus, students come to this course uh, largely receptive to open source software and educational resources. Uh, to introduce students to popular types of open source software, uh, programming, programming language, and information sharing platforms, namely uh, QGIS, R, and GitHub. Uh, QGIS is an open source platform for analyzing and visualizing spatial data. Uh, the pro programming language R allows for the analysis and visualization of data. And GitHub is a platform where programmers can share code and information. Uh, these are by no means a comprehensive, comprehensive list with respect to the options of available for uh, open source tools uh, in spatial science, but are some of the most frequently used. And now I will pass it over to Jane, who would uh, discuss some of our impact and challenges we encountered. Thank you, Alvaro. Um, OK, so I'll be discussing the immediate impacts of this project for our library. And so um, one of them would be uh, relationship building. And so this really provided us the opportunity to cement a relationship with our STEM faculty. Um, we were able to collaborate with many other um, departments and teams outside of our own library. So one of them being um, the USC Center for Excellence. And this has led to um, more projects um, besides this one. And we were also able to connect with the student government um, at USC. And so um, we were able to discuss uh, adopting um, OER as like an institutional policy and just different ways that we could uh, work together there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. And so um, from this, in terms of outcome, a total of 613 students um, from year one and year two com combined uh, were able to benefit from this project each semester that these um, courses are offered. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, in terms of cost savings, uh, students have saved around uh, $76,000 every semester these courses are offered, which is a significant financial impact for our students. Next slide. So um, in discussing like the various challenges that our team faced just from this project, um, we had a large number of applicants in our first year, and this interest uh, stemmed from faculty outside of um, uh, this, this interest stemmed from outside of uh, the typical STEM faculty. So we had um, STEM certified uh, business and accounting uh, faculty interested as well, but just for our project's um, capacity and for our expertise as well, we uh, decided to um, keep it remaining within the fields uh, that we specifically liaisoned with. And um, but after our first year, we did have some difficulty recruiting participants in the second year and a uh, additional second year participant did not follow through on the project as well. And so uh, keeping interest and keeping traction on just how this project was continuing was a big challenge for us. In terms of um, at the institutional level, uh, like Alvaro uh, mentioned earlier, um, some departments required approval to use 
um, a specific textbook and a lot of the times um, there wasn't necessarily a consideration for uh, the financial means or accessibility of our students. It was just a policy that wasn't being enforced. And um, so even though in year one, we worked with a specific group of students from the uh, undergraduate student government, uh, the changes from the year one to year two made it difficult to gain any traction in uh, changing or um, impacting institutional policy. And there still remains a lack of institutional initiative to discuss uh, OER policy at um, the greater administrative level. And then for our own library, because um, our collection development policy does not uh, purchase the textbooks, um, any kind of progress really depended on any individual interest and effort. And so um, this, these were just some of the main challenges that we faced. Next slide, please. And so um, in discussing like what we could do uh, from our outcomes from this project, we decided to um, advocate for an OER librarian. This was a lot of work and just a very enormous project just for um, our own department as well. And so um, having a OER librarian uh, would be very impactful for the entire uh, university itself. And uh, we also advocate for the institutional adoption of OER policy. Just seeing how this affected just students from our own department can really uh, have a greater impact on student accessibility to textbooks at a greater, wider institutional level. And so that's something that we're um, advocating for. And we also think that this project aligns with um, numerous uh, USC initiatives currently um, being um, pushed. And so we find that this was some of the next steps that we could do. Uh, next, next slide, please. And so um, we encourage, we thank you all for listening to our presentation and we encourage you to reach out to our uh, email at uh, sellibrarians at usc.edu if you have any questions. Um, uh, some of us will remain after the presentation as well to, um, for any questions in the breakout rooms as well. So uh, thank you all for listening. All right, I think we will move on to our final presentation. And, uh, and you will have opportunities to ask questions in the breakout rooms after, so. Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Michelle Desiletz, and along with my colleague Beth Pickard, uh, we are STEM librarians at Portland State University. And today we are going to share with you about our research related to information literacy instruction and vulnerable students, vulnerable students' persistence in STEM, with a particular focus on leveraging outreach. To provide you with a little bit of context of our research, uh, Beth and I serve as liaisons to five STEM departments at Portland State University, biology, environmental science and management, geography, geology, and system science. And our particular um, focus, this, this research is related to a chapter that we published. And the focus for us was um, mostly on first generation students in terms of that vulnerable aspect. And over 30% of PSU STEM majors are first generation students. Uh, the statistics from 2012 to 2019. Our study looked at uh, four years of traditional outreach, followed by four years of outreach during a new university initiative. And in a little bit, Beth will share more details about the, the initiative that we used. Um, one of the things that we noted was a lack of information literacy instruction in STEM courses in the four years of traditional outreach. And then following that, we successfully leveraged opportunities to increase the information literacy instruction in STEM courses via this new university-wide initiative. And really because the efforts were successful, we wondered why. What was different about the new initiative and the things that we did uh, in conjunction with the new initiative that made 
those efforts successful. So we sought to analyze why it worked, in what ways the efforts were successful, and why they worked as compared to the traditional approaches that we had previously used. And in searching for a way to analyze this information, we chose to use a retrospective analysis to answer those questions, really with the idea that these efforts were successful and we wanted to be able to replicate them and we wanted to be able to share the characteristics that we were able to identify that made them successful so that other librarians might also be able to increase ILI and in STEM courses. Uh, in terms of the retrospective analysis, it's a method that's used in social sciences and sciences, especially in health sciences, and uh, the Encyclopedia of Case Study Research defines it as a case study design in which all of the data uh, are collected after the fact. So the activities, the events and activities under study have already occurred, and the outcomes of the events and activities are known. And so retrospective analysis really provides a way to study activities that have already occurred Thus, we used it to understand how and why our ILI efforts associated with this new university-wide initiative were successful. Really uh, core to these efforts were the literature review. And of course, all research almost all research involves literature reviews. But for us, the results of the literature review almost became a part of the findings because the literature review really helped us determine the context of the analysis and establish the significance of the problem of missing ILI and college STEM curricula. We had obviously recognized that this was a problem at our local level at PSU, but the literature review really served to um, confirm for us that this is a national issue. Uh, first generation students appear to be less likely to persist in STEM majors. There's a connection between feelings of self-efficacy and persistence in STEM majors for all students. And information literacy instruction can help first-generation students and really all students develop the self-efficacy necessary to persist. And then lastly, uh, ILI is not included in college STEM curricula despite an identified need by faculty and um, science organizations and standards. For example, ACRL's information literacy standards for science and engineering technology and the National Research Council's call for information skills and scientists. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Beth to provide some more details of our new re outreach opportunities. Hi, thanks so much, Michelle. So we, um, our new outreach, um, we call the small victories and the name of the chapter actually in the ALA book is, is, uh, is small, small victories because even though it was, we, it, it was a victory, right? The numbers were sort of, the, the increases were somewhat small. We'll talk about them, but they were, they were significant. And I'll talk about sort of why, why the, um, the things that we found were, were significant. Um, we'll, and so this is what our new, new our, our old outreach consisted of in our new outreach, right? The traditional outreach at, at PSU my, for, for Michelle and myself so had been really to email a, a, an introduction to uh, either new faculty or if we were, or if we shifted departments and, and started working with a new department to introduce ourselves and say, hi, I'm, I'm, you know, Beth, I cover these areas and I can, these are the services I can offer you. Like I can do some collection development work. I can um, teach some information literacy sessions for your for your classes. They were pretty broad, right? Um, and then we also had a quarterly newsletter that more or less covered the same kind of, and we still do this, a quarterly newsletter that the newsletter that um, describes who we are, what we can do, and maybe any new you know databases or changes to services that we have. But again, it's kind of a cold call and it's pretty broad. Um, we try to be as specific as possible, but we're trying to cover like, for example, all of geography or all of ESM, which is environmental science at PSU. And also for context, you know, at uh, um, some departments want the library to contact just the chair or maybe just an appointed library person in their department. They don't necessarily want us to contact all, the whole faculty. Some, some departments are okay with us, you know, sending this newsletter or these emails out to um, all of the faculty. It really goes, we have to honor whatever the department decides. So sometimes we have a lot of access to the faculty and sometimes we don't. In the new outreach opportunity for the new university initiative, um, this was a flexible degrees initiative. We saw the potential for some different kinds of outreach and tried to, um, you know, get in there on a, maybe a more specific level. And so 
the new out, the new university initiative was called Flexible Degrees Initiative, and it was sort of put forward by the Office of Academic Innovation, OAI. And this is ongoing. It's, it offers financial and instructional design support to departments developing online degree programs or certificate programs. And they involve um, the subject librarians to in the in the planning meetings. And depending on the depending on the situation, it might be one planning meeting, it might be multiple planning meetings. It kind of depends on the instructional designer, the faculty and the librarian. But um, we're there, we're there at the table, right, as part of the planning for these courses and for the set of courses that go into a degree or certificate. And we're looking, this study particularly looks at the um, first sort of first round of flexible degrees, which was, which included the departments of environmental science and management and also geography. And just for a little bit of context, um, I was a librarian <laughs> in this situation, and I immediately like got um, into a relationship, conversations with five ESM faculty and four geography faculty I'd never met before. So I, I, there was already outreach just kind of inherent in that, in that setting. Next slide, please. So during the planning meetings, this is what I did. This is what I, this, this and this is, and, and, and Michelle's been part of this too in some, in, uh, in some other ways, but in this particular situation, this is what we did. During the planning meetings, um, I, I, I you know, mentioned collections, but I saw it as an opportunity to really put the need for information literacy instruction specifically in the context at our university and, and for these specific courses. So I put extra emphasis on the need for ILI at PSU, and I refer to the admissions parameters. PSU has really specific admissions parameters that give us a, a particular set of uh, a particular student situation, which is that there are no there are no parameters around um, writing or research. So students, for example, in the 300 level class can, at PSU may have had a lot of experience doing academic research or none, right? And the instructors have to teach that in that in to that class, right? Like with that breadth of, of, of experience. And, and similarly, um, demographic, our demographics at PSU include, include a large percentage of students who, may, who come to academic research potentially with accumulated disadvantage. And this is from the research. The research list thinks of cumulative disadvantage as, um, as a, well, a first generation would be like one idea of a vulnerable, a student who's a first generation student. But like the, the findings are that a, a first generation student is also somebody who potentially often um, falls into multiple categories of vulnerability, right? So there are many different ways in which um, students who are vulnerable might, um, the vulnerability uh, has to do with persistence, right? Like, so they might, there might be many reasons why a person might might have difficulty uh, persisting in, in a STEM major or in college, you know, specific, generally. Um, I also got the opportunity to point to my own research in this in this situation, right? And and to make it um, to make it kind of relevant to show that my research really looks at um, at uh, I, I typically use ethnographic means to look at. Uh, so student research process as it sort of encounters the library and faculty expectations around student research and sort of the overlap or the disparities um, therein. So, you know, one of the things that I that I brought up was that scaffolding research skills into curricula because we were designing curriculum at that point, curriculum, the curricula at that point. Um, even something as small as giving students a citation instead of a PDF can do some important information and literacy instruction work. So my idea was you may not want a librarian to teach for you. That may not be what you what you're looking for. But if, if you can at least give students like a citation for required readings, that, that then some information literacy instruction gets in there. Students have some independence, um, knowing what's out there and where to and where to get their hands on it. Um, and as a selling point, I also took the opportunity because this was one of the findings from my research. It's pretty well documented that either. Um, having a librarian teach an information literacy instruction session or scaffolding research skills into a, the curriculum can re reduce the instructor's workload, right? And that's, that's sort of like, if nothing else, don't you want to do less work kind of thing? So yeah, next slide, please. So this was, this was the result of the outreach, right? Before, and we'll look for this moment, well, I want to look at ESM and geography. Before we, in the four years leading up to the new university initiative, we had taught a total of four <laughs> information literacy instruction sessions in geography and three in ESM. Afterwards, there were 14 in ESM and nine in geography. And while those numbers are still not ideal, right? That's that does not rep, that's like a very small portion of the number of ESM classes and geography classes that are taught at PSU. But it is, you know, more more than um four times as much in ESM and, and more than twice as much in geography. So, so percentage-wise, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big increase. And if we look at everything collectively, there was an there was effect on our the flex degrees actually had 
uh, an impact on biology as well, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So, but if you look at it cumulatively, right, we went from teaching eight classes total to teaching 30 classes total across these five departments. So that's a pretty big increase. That's like 275%, you know, again, like almost four times as much overall. So that's, that's a small victory, but it's a victory for sure. Um, in biology, it, what, but, and as a contrast in the two set, the two departments, geology and system science, for which there were no flexible degrees initiatives, there was no increase in information literacy instruction. So it's a contrast point. Next slide, please. So not in the numbers, but also significant in terms of impact were that within the year um, following these, these planning meetings, um, three of the five ESM faculty that were involved in the flexible degrees initiative scheduled information literacy instruction sessions for their existing face-to-face -face courses. And two others incorporated it, incorporated them, incorporated it sorry, into their existing asynchronous courses. So the, the, the flex degrees courses hadn't happened, but the, but the faculty saw it value, enough value in what we had done, the outreach we had done to, to, to work that into their um, existing courses, to work some information literacy instruction into their existing courses. And similarly, three of the geog all three geography faculty uh, requested ILI for their existing courses. And I mentioned the biology piece, right? One of the ESM faculty that was in flexible degrees um, started teaching biology courses and, and he brought in um, some information literacy instruction to the to the biology department. And another biology instructor, he he referred, he recommended our information literacy instruction sessions uh, to another biology instructor. And so we got we got some, you know, we got we got some uh, some buy-in that way as well. And again, contrast, right? Geology and systems didn't have any flexible degrees initiatives, so there was really no movement in the, in those in those departments. Next slide, please. Another impact that's not the numbers don't necessarily capture or that the la the first slide didn't is that you know it strengthened our relationship with the departments. The we, the librarian went from teaching only for only one faculty member per department, one in geography, one in ESM, one in biology, to teaching for. Uh, three in geography, four in ESM, and two in biology. And so while that's not like the numbers aren't huge, they are, they are, they are significantly different than, than where we started. And that's an additional six faculty members total. And if they can all go like biology, right, then they sort of have more fingers <laughs> or more legs. I'm, I'm using the body parts thing I told Michelle I wouldn't use. <laughs> but it, but it, it has some, it, it carries some heft beyond just the people that, um, that we work with, that we that we met with directly, like those people talk to other people, and then you know we get more outreach. I mean, we get more um, information literacy instruction in STEM courses. So we, next slide, please. We next can't slide. resist the biology. Here. I couldn't do it. <laughs> um, there was also more library use. There was like it was suggested there was more library use. Two of the ESM faculty uh, reported that before the meetings they didn't they weren't aware of the ESM li like light guide. They weren't aware of the subject guide at all. For all of my best efforts, they weren't aware of it. But after the planning meeting, since then they um, they now regularly point students to the ESM guide and they assign exercises that require students to use the library guide. So they not only point people students to the guide and say go there, they actually think it's important to teach students how to use it. So while I'm not necessarily teaching the students in this situation, there is some information literacy instruction that's occurring, right? And there's some value of the library, right? And some use of the library that's happening and it's happening differently than it happened before. There, likewise, there's a change and uh, there's more library use by the students, right? One of the ESM faculty did an interterm survey um, after, you know, after I, after I taught for them that 34 um, out of their 36 students felt and this is this is so this is a reflection of their self of the students' self sense of self-efficacy, right? Um, that they are now better able to investigate questions of science using library resources. That they use the library and the databases all the time now, right? So change and in, uh, increase in self that self-efficacy that's that the research ties to directly to persistence. Next slide, please. So why? Why did this work? It seems to have worked. Why did it work? And this is the this is what we sort of see as our toolkit, right? Why did it work? These are the if if we can find these, we're not gonna run into even the same situation we ran into, like Michelle and I in our uh, flexible degrees initiatives. And, and there might not be an exact replica of this situation for anybody ever again at any university. But what we were hoping to do is identify the things that made within this context of this initiative uh, that made this outreach successful, such that we could look for other situations that might have these same characteristics and do outreach that way that in that situation or in that particular way so why did it work right well 
this outreach got to target a specific course, right? Uh, it, uh, it was a specific or a specific set of courses, right? Which contextualized the librarian's outreach as immediately, immediately relevant rather than a sort of broad cold call email rather than saying, I can teach some information literacy sessions for your geography class. I could say, hey, we have a water rights class here. So why don't we use the um, en encyclopedia of water history, right? And then we can also look at, um, you know, we can, we can go into, a web of science using this particular article that you want to use for the course and trace the conversation around it forwards and backwards and look what it does. So the relevance was a lot more obvious, right, to the to the instructors um, with whom I was working. It also occurred at the point of curriculum, the, the conversations occurred at the, the outreach occurred at the point of curriculum development, which is really the point of need for faculty. So it, the outreach occurred at the same time the instructors were developing the course curriculum rather than afterwards. Like if the instructor has been teaching a course for 10 years, they have to go back in and change all that stuff to try to work in a library. Or at least maybe that's how it feels to them, right? That they have to do this kind of like revamping of something they feel is already working to sort of work us in. Um, whereas this, it's a blank slate. There was no, um, there wasn't a curriculum to change, right? So the idea was let's, um, why not include a librarian, especially if it if it means I don't have to, if it actually saves me time, which you know is part of my sort of outreach thing. Like I can save you time and work um, if this if if we if we work some uh, research skills instruction in there. Um, so right, so it occurred at this particular important juncture, right? And it also inherently positioned the librarian as an expert. It, it pointed to the librarian as an expert in a way that cold call outreach just doesn't. Um, necessarily, right? If, I mean, not that people don't think we're experts, but it really underscored it. It really highlighted it, right? At, by positioning us as as a team of ex, on a team of experts, as part of a team of experts, um, it emphasized the fact that we have expertise first of all, and that that expertise is not only relevant but necessary to course curricula. It suggests that we are we are on equal footing with our own set of expertise that is important to developing a course, right? So, next slide, please. It also, this kind of outreach also, there was designated designated time for it, right? It was as part of a larger initiative. It didn't require teaching faculty to expend any extra time or effort to meet with a librarian. And likewise, it didn't require any extra time for the librarian to meet with them. So it saved us a little of that legwork too, right? Um, it also positioned, uh, positioned the librarian as part of a team, right? It wasn't a cold call. So we didn't go on this sort of to-do list, um, that the faculty had to say, hey, that's another thing for me to do. And it also allowed us to go into the sort of nuances and, and the specifics that I've already mentioned, right? Rather than broadly listing our services, I could say, hey, this is, look, specific PSU situation, look at the literature, look at my literature, my, my research and how that uh, informs the specifics. Um, and I could assume that the teaching faculty was in a position to listen because we all were given time around the table, right? This was just my turn and they had their turn and we were all there and knew that was going to happen. So yeah, next slide, please. I'm going to hand it back to Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Beth. So uh, just to leave you with a, a few closing uh, thoughts and next steps, ideas for future research. So um, and using the approach that we did, the findings from this analysis, uh, we're really hoping can help librarians develop outreach that can lead to the incorporation of much needed ILI and STEM college courses, really to increase the, the ILI and the STEM courses. So we really wanted to identify some of those characteristics uh, that might be um, transferable to other opportunities or experiences at other institutions. Uh, utilizing existing lines of communication and delivery can reduce everyone's legwork and, and workload. So thinking about how that can benefit not only us as librarians, but also the faculty with whom we're working. I also want to point out that, and Beth mentioned this, I think I mentioned it as well earlier, the situations will not be the same. We do not expect that other institutions will, or even that we will have the opportunity again necessarily for this ex exact type of formal um, uh, opportunity. But there are, uh, there, it could be something much more simple. It could be a shared um, committee membership where you are sort of have time to build that relationship as an expert, for example. And then your, your fa the faculty member brings you in at that point of curriculum development. So I, I think that just if identifying these characteristics helps us think a little bit more creatively about non-traditional opportunities, we you know, I, we tend to get sort of in our tunnel vision of we all have a lot of work and we have these certain things that we do. And so maybe this will open up some um, 
uh, open us up to some other opportunities. And then retrospective studies are really exploratory. So we might press more on the findings from this study uh, and see where that leads, or we might use the findings of this study for the basis of other research. For example, looking at nuances of uh, information literary, literacy instructions effects on first generation STEM students research practices, their persistence in college, uh, and their persistence in STEM. Or we might look at implications of college information literacy instruction or lack thereof on research conducted later in professional and postgraduate academic STEM settings. I think that's a really important um, point to make is we really focused on higher ed in our presentation, but thinking beyond higher ed, what happens later? What are the implications for um, science professions and the integrity of science professions? And then lastly, just um, thinking about the fact that information literacy instruction that supports vulnerable STEM students, which is sort of our focus with the first gen, it, it benefits and supports all STEM students. So it's definitely valuable and worth our time. And with that, we let, leave you with numerous references to explore on your own if you so desire. Um, and thank you and provided our contact information. If you have questions or join us in the breakout room next. All right. Um, thanks to all of our presenters for these excellent presentations and thank you attendees for joining us at the research forum. And I'll turn it over to Kathy who will explain how the breakout